<clears throat> All right. Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? Yes, Meg. I'll Thank second. You. Thank you, Kim. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. I'll, I'll second. second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Stacy. Is there any discussion about either of the items? This includes the um, October 25th, 2022 Board of Ed meetings, uh, meeting minutes, as well as the approval of a donation from Grin and Barrett. Any discussion? Nope. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Audience of citizens, do we have anybody who wishes to address us? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And then we will move along to our Portland Public School Spotlight. And tonight we are joined by Library Media Specialist Karen Madzowitz from Gildersleeve. And we are so happy to have you. Thank Why don't you, you can join us at the podium if you don't mind. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, Karen. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here tonight to brag about some of the things that are going on in our school libraries. And for those of you who don't know me, um, I started my teaching career here in Portland as a fourth grade teacher where I taught for about 12 years at Gildersleeve and then I moved into the library, taught at Gildersleeve's library for about six years and then moved to the high school, middle school where I taught for about 10 and then decided to move back down to Gildersleeve where really and truly that is where my heart is. And um, so when I went back down to Gildersleeve, a few things had changed. Um, in my earlier years teaching at Gildersleeve in the library, we always had library assistants, so they helped with many of the duties when I was teaching classes and planning for classes and you know, uh, maintaining some of the other administrative parts of the library, but the assistant was great helping with processing books, um, checking in books, and of course putting them back on the shelves, which takes a lot of time because at elementary school, everyone is checking out multiple books. <laughs> so it became apparent that I needed a little bit of help. And um, so my first year there, I decided to just ask some kids if they wanted to help check in, uh, not check in books, but just put books back on the shelves. So I taught them. And um, if you can show slide one, uh, slide two, I mean, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so it was just informal. Students um, started helping a little bit in the library, putting books away, and they <clears throat> loved it, as you can see. Um, then they wanted to help with displays, and so I started to allow them to come up with the ideas for the displays, decide which books we wanted to show, and other things we needed on the displays, so they did that. Um, and next slide, please. We. Uh, <laughs> Then the following year, COVID hit. So uh, things, of course, were quite different. And um, so I was teaching on a cart. So kids weren't checking out books. And we didn't have to, we didn't have a need for library helpers. Uh, and the year after that, I was asked to teach a fourth grade class. So I was in the classroom teaching fourth grade. So things really changed. Uh, and it wasn't until this past year that we were back in normal situations and I was back in the library and I did a little searching on, you know, different ways to get students involved in, in more ways and um, came up with the idea for library ambassadors. Uh, so we started the library ambassadors. Next slide, please. And um, students, so many students wanted to help. It was tough to choose who, you know, who was going to help. At first, it was just kids who were like, can I help out in the library? So of course, you know, it was sort of still informal. Um, but then I did uh, create a little application that they had to fill out. Um, we were looking for students who, you know, uh, students who wanted to take on a leadership role, students who, of course, loved the library, loved reading. And um, so I asked uh, some of the fourth grade teachers if they wanted to recommend uh, any students to help in the library. 
and so they did. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and uh, we set out with an application here. So the application <laughs> um, boasted that ambassadors are reliable, honest, good citizens. Um, it talked about the duties that they would have, which I'll go into in a minute. And of course, the perks, the good stuff that they would get, um, parties and um, a few <laughs> other things that you'll see in a moment. There was a self-rating on the application. I wanted to kids to sort of self-reflect and see um, how they were doing in the classroom. You know, uh, I impressed upon them that they, they needed to keep up with their grades and of course their behavior and just be role models within the school. Um, they had to get some teacher recommendations, one or two teacher recommendations, and of course have their parents sign and then they signed it. Um, up in the corner, you can see, um, I also impressed about them the importance of libraries and privacy. <clears throat> so we read a statement through together in small groups and um, uh, they had to sign it, just saying that any, if, when they're checking in books and they see other students' records, that they have to keep that private. They're not allowed to discuss it amongst each other or with anyone else except me if the need arise. So um, I thought that was really important, that they knew that's really important with libraries, privacy. So um, <clears throat> let's let the students tell you a little bit about what they do as library ambassadors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Kenzie, and we're here to tell you about library ambassadors. <laughs> First, we check in books. <laughs> <laughs> then we organize shelves. <laughs> we also help with displays and decorations. <laughs> and we adjust comfy seating. <coughs> then we clean and organize the maker space. <laughs> I love it. I love that. So that was all the kids. You could show the next slide. They, I just said to them that I was going to be presenting <clears throat> to the board about library ambassadors. I said, if you guys wanted to make a little video of um, some of the things you do, great. Well, they <laughs> took it to the end. Um, so they came in during recesses. They, they wrote the scripts. They directed it, they produced it, but they, they had so many different trials of it, it was so funny. And um, really, it was all them. I had no say, they did it, they went with it. They, they, like I said, they had a lot of different takes on it. And um, it's just all them, and, and I, I just love it. The way, you know, they, she stands yeah. there. <laughs> I mean, it was just so cute. So that's some of the stuff that they do as library ambassadors. <clears throat> and uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so some of the other perks are, um, there's your daughter. There's my core. Love it. <laughs> so this is the crew from last year. Oh, the crew who did the video was this year's crew. Um, so last year's crew, um, one of the things that they got to do was we went outside, we wanted to have a winter bulletin board out in the hall, and we decided to go outside and take some pictures. There was no snow yet, um, but we went with it. And then, of course, they became the subjects of the bulletin board. If you can see in the upper corner, <laughs> their pictures were plastered on the board. Um, I, I, as you know, I um, am the coordinator of the social media for K through six, but I also have a Gildersleeve Library um, 
Instagram account. So I often put out posts on that if you wanted to follow us. It's Gildersleeve School Library mm -hmm. on Instagram. And I often put, you know, put posts up there, so there's, there's one to show you. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Students um, are the first ones that see boxes of books when they come in, so they help me check in the books. We go through the packing slip, they check in the books, uh, and um, of course get first picks on what they want to check out, of course, after we process the books. We have a book fair each year in March, and students help organize that. Here they're getting flyers ready for students. They um, also did some advertising. They were able to get the green screen out and um, create some ads for the book fair. So it's part of our makerspace stuff. And then they helped, they put up all the posters at the book fair. They, um, and then of course they loved making their own name tags and they came to the book fair with their families and they were able to help out the book fair. So they took parents around, they asked other, family, other families if they needed help locating items, and they just had a blast. Again, taking on that leadership role, feeling independent, feeling good about themselves, you know, just I wanted to empower them in that way. Um, and then on the other side there, they're also helping out with some <coughs> uh, advertisement for the book fair. And it's also our art and literacy event as well at Gildersleeve, so. Uh, okay, so we have an I Spy tank. They helped to create that, and that's part of our makerspace. Students are able to take a slip and try to find different items in the I Spy tank. These two ambassadors were helping to create it, and they love that, the independence of doing that type of work on their own. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a holiday party, so we had a little holiday party in December, and books arrived that day, so that was part of the party. <laughs> <laughs> they love that, and they love to pose for the pictures and all of that, next slide. Um, and then there's also just fun in the library. It's not just work, work, work. They, they come in um, during their recesses as they want to. They're able to sign up, uh, make their own schedule. Some students want to come in once a week. Some want to come in five days a week. I encourage them to go outside to recess and only come in a little bit. You know, I think it's important for them to play with their friends. Uh, and they, last year they were able to come in in the morning as well, which was uh, excellent. And this year I have calf duty in the morning, so I can't have any helpers coming in. But um, here they are just after helping, uh, hanging out and having some fun putting the stick together poster together. <laughs> <clears throat> this was a huge perk. We um, raised, we hatched chickens last year in the library, and so of course they were the first ones to get to hold them. <laughs> <laughs> and they were really excited about this um, because we did have some students who had chickens at home, so they were like the experts, and they became the experts at the school. <laughs> so it was, it was just fantastic. Um, and the next slide just shows a little bit more about um, the chicks and. Uh, you know, the students were able to help with the feeding, make sure that the humidity levels were good in the, um, uh, what is it called again? Incubator. Thank you. Incubator. <laughs> <laughs> I better get ready. That's coming back around in <laughs> April. <laughs> Thanks. Next slide. Um, so as the kids mentioned, they clean up in the makerspace. Uh, all of our libraries have a makerspace, as you know. Um, we were awarded a Gildersleeve Wheeler um, grant a few years back to create makerspaces in each of the school libraries. So um, they get messy. And our ambassadors do help uh, to keep them organized. And I don't know um, if you caught the one of the posts on the um, Portland Public Schools, Facebook and Instagram about the kid, the second graders this year. Did anybody see them in their band with the instruments they created? No. You have no, got to go back and watch <laughs> that. So the students, we, we do Makerspace, uh, we did the cardboard challenge this year and oftentimes I'll read books to the students and then we'll try to come up with an activity that they can do. So one of them was um, Ada's Violin a book about um, the Paraguay uh, Orchestra. It's a true story. So the students wanted to create musical instruments. And if you go on 
the Instagram and Facebook pages, I believe, um, I posted the video and it's just hilarious because these students, I just said, okay, start playing, I'm gonna videotape you. Well, after about <laughs> 10 seconds, they started to break out in song, unplanned. <laughs> they just, it was just oh, the most precious thing. And so you'll, you can see that if you watch the video. Um, and again, just totally unplanned. They started breaking out in a, a Go Noodle song. <laughs> Go Noodle is um, where kids get exercise in the classroom and they just started singing it. It was just precious. So Makerspace, we love it. Um, next slide. One of the perks for me about the Library Ambassadors Club, besides having helpers put books away, is that I get to see kids just pause, stop what they're doing because they found a book that they love and they just want to dive into it. So here you can see a couple girls just doing that. You know, they're in the middle of helping and all of a sudden they break out in read. <laughs> so I love that. And let's see what else we have. So uh, they also <clears throat> train the next group of kids who are going to be coming up as ambassadors. So. Um, uh, how did I end up? This year I, I kind of gauged it by the kids I knew and I thought might want to help and I could try to keep it diverse and um, asked classroom teachers if they wanted to recommend anyone and they did and um, started, I just started to ask students if they wanted to help and told them how they'd have to come in during recesses. They came in and the fourth graders started to train them and they, they loved that. They couldn't wait for that. They took it on. They took their one student came in, come on, let's go, and they took them to a section of the library and just started training them on different aspects and different things we do, because they do do a lot more than just putting books away. As you saw, they, they help with the labeling and such, so it's great. <clears throat> Next slide. This was just the other day. Again, they finished their work, and they just sat down, they chatted, and they just read, and they look at books together, and they just have fun. And that is the Library Ambassador Program. And um, the program is also uh, being <coughs> conducted at Brownstone this year. And uh, we hope to continue it for many years. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> All right, thanks I'm for just, having I'm me. I'm so glad you were able to come and, and share this with the board. I mean, you also have my daughter, so I can speak from a parent perspective that this program is, the, the, it's so impactful for the students who get to participate. And beyond the leadership piece and the, uh, you know, the skill building piece, it's like the, the way they get to kind of take ownership of the library space mm -hmm. is just, it was amazing to watch. Thank you for doing it. It's such a great idea. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. We'll have Greta in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's a tough act to follow, but um, <laughs> we've got our student represent representative report up next. So if, if we could unmute them. Hello. Hi. Hi. So this year, seniors were given the opportunity to reserve and gain a parking spot. Um, I actually had the privilege to participate in this event, and I will say it was very fun. Um, not only was it a bonding activity for the members of the senior class, <coughs> but we had to show off our greatest styles for our parking spot. So if you get the chance to visit the student parking lot at the HS, I highly recommend checking out the Great Ocon Harbor. It is very impressive. Mm -hmm. um, girls soccer team made it to class as semifinals. We need a tomorrow at 7, and there will be a game bus for students who are so 
see things like their streets, their lockers, and even got to walk onto the field the same way the players do on game day. <laughs> wow. On October 26th, the juniors hosted a Halloween dance. They made over $600. It lasted three hours, and a decent amount of people wore costumes. And I would have to say, the costumes were pretty creative, not some basic plain ones. I saw a lot of creativity and innovative costumes out there. So Senate has the food drive starting tomorrow. We will be collecting canned goods and turkeys for the fall food drive. Everything collected will go to the Portland Food Bank. Starting on November 10th, ending November 13th, seven juniors along with our advisor we went on the ultimate Mega Power Trip. It was held in Washington, D.C. this year. It was a three-day event. What we did there was we had a mock role play competition. We went to workshops that involved leadership, focusing on how to be a better leader, learning, focused on several career job paths, and college workshops which worked with finding the right fit for you. And we also had some wonderful speakers and artists who advocated for Make-A-Wish Foundation and a motivational speaker who was all about loving yourself before anyone else. And then at the end of this amazing trip, we got a night tour of DC. So Senate is currently working on the semi-formal dance to Stonewall. It will be held on December 3rd. Our theme is book winter fairy tale with intentions of a more snowy forest look to it. Lastly, I have the class of 2024 is having a DQ fundraiser on November 21st from 4 to 9 p.m. All you would have to do is go to Dairy Queen in Portland and order anything, even a small ice cream cone, to help to support this class. As vice president of the class of 2024 and a student overall, I recommend you all go ahead and buy something. Maybe surprise your children or grandchildren with a sweet treat. <laughs> it's a good idea. Awesome. Where is the um, game tomorrow? Um, where is the soccer game? Waterbury. Oh, Waterbury Municipal, oh, Waterbury. municipal okay. Stadium. Been there plenty of times. Oh, municipal <laughs> Stadium. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Unfortunately, there's a board of selectmen meeting at the same yeah, time. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna hope they get through that agenda quick, so get there for the second half at least. Yeah. Thank you for the update. Are there any questions for our student representatives? No. Go girls soccer. Yeah. <laughs> That's exciting. Thank you. Thank you both so much. The reports this week. Yeah, this lots going on. Huh? It's yeah. nice to hear that update. I appreciate that. Um, all right. Our communications and updates. Dr. Britton. All right. Thank you. So um, I included we included with your packet. Uh, we did receive a letter of resignation from uh, Kelly Young after five years of service as the administrative assistant in the high school library. I mean, high school main office. Uh, <laughs> library on the mind now. Um, <laughs> wish Kelly all the best of luck. Um, we are going to have big shoes to fill with Kelly. Um, certainly, wish her continued success and, and whatever she goes on to do. Um, also included the uh, November enrollment for you. Pretty stable so far this year. Um, Happy to answer any questions about either of those two things before I move on to a couple of my other communications. All right, so um, I did do want to give you an update. We we had it's kind of like two steps forward, one step back. We've had a, an, another challenge with our seventh grade math teacher at the middle school. We offered the position, the position was accepted, and unfortunately, within a week, the teacher who accepted the position took another position in another district. So. Yeah, it was disappointing. Now, I am very grateful to our current math <coughs> teachers. So we're very lucky to have Isha Murphy, Jenna Bell, Jenny uh, Bell, and, and Brianna Vizone have stepped up to take on a sixth section. So they are each teaching one of the five um, seventh grade sections. And then Elaine Sunt, who is our um, uh, interventionist that we hired this year, she's picking up the other two. So we have the five sections covered with highly qualified certified math teachers and for the seventh graders it's pretty cool because they're getting their seventh grade classes some of them are walking over to the high school side and having them mm. with high school teachers cool. so it's from what I hear it's it's fun for them in, in that <laughs> respect um, but I can't thank Jenny Isha Brianna and um, Elaine enough 
for doing this. Now, the good news is I did talk to um, Chuck today. He is interviewing two candidates, and he's very excited about potentially one. So um, we, you know, that process involves interviewing, reference tracking. We have the interview interviewees come and do mock lessons for us. That's all happening now. I hope that by our next board meeting, I'm reporting to you that we have um, a math teacher in that position. But I think we're in real, we're in a good place for the time being. Again, two steps forward, one step back. I, I hope to have a math teacher in that position by our next board meeting, though. Um, but again, I can't thank those teachers enough for stepping up. It's a lot, you know, for teachers to teach <coughs> six courses. It is a lot, um, and um, they recognize the need. We asked them nicely, and. and they w w willingly did it. I think it speaks to their character and, and commitment to our students, and I, I can't thank them enough for that. Um, I'll stop there. Any questions about seventh grade math? No. Okay, second one. I just put in there, and, and I apologize. I, I just finished it today. I couldn't get it in there any quicker for you. I put it, it as part of your communications um, and updates, a copy of the mental health grant. Um, thank you to Dawn and thank you to Chuck Hershon for helping me put this together in such a short time frame. It was a lot of data to gather and organize it and re reviewing it, but I, th I think we did a nice job. Um, so I put in there both the RFP from the state, the request for proposals, and then the narratives that I wrote. So I submitted those today and thank you, Stephanie, for helping me put in the, the budget numbers for it. So we are requesting um, grant funding to fund a, a full-time social worker at the middle school. We currently have that position funded with our ESSER money. If we were to receive this grant, we would reallocate that ESSER money. I would recommend to what else I have, our big topic for tonight is the HVAC grant and the, the you know, improvements we need to make with indoor air quality in the district. Um, so I'm hopeful. Now the grant's not huge, it's $5 million, which isn't a lot of money, especially considering we're asking for which, 350? 360. 360. So, mm -hmm. You know, I'm hopeful. Um, it's a competitive grant. I'll, I'll keep you posted, um, but we did our best. Right? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Hopefully yep. we'll get it. Yep. Otherwise, that social worker will definitely be there for the rest of this year and next year, whether it's ESSCR money. If we get this grant, it'll be this year, next year, and the year after. Year after. Um, but this is a real need, and, and I'm, I'm delighted that, that the, the, the state and everybody's paying attention to the mental health needs of our students recovering from the pandemic, and even pre-pandemic, there were some pretty significant needs. So mm -hmm. um, I'm happy we had this opportunity, and if, if anybody has the opportunity to speak with state legislators, encourage them to pass legislation for more. Right. I would love to see, instead of $5 million, this to be $15 million and an ongoing thing. I, I, I see that um, the, the need to fund these positions, and I'm, I'm grateful that we had the opportunity at least to apply, and I hope I have good news for you in the future. Um, any questions about that mental health grant? Okay, um, quick update. I just want to let everybody know very briefly a little bit of the process that I use to make calls about the weather, especially considering we might be driving home tonight in a little bit of <laughs> wintry. Um, oh, no, there we go. Uh, maybe mood snow. Is it really? Thank you, Karen. Oh, goodness. So I did put out an, an email to the community today just letting everybody know. So um, the way it works is I try to make the decision the night before. If it's a clear, you know, going to be a wallop no, uh, storm, I think families and I know our, our faculty and staff appreciate knowing the night before so we can, you know, um, plan our lives <laughs> for the snow days. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, like with tonight's event, it's not always clear cut. In those cases when it's not so clear cut, I'm up at... 4.30 in the morning. There are two superintendents <coughs> groups that I collaborate with. One is a statewide one where I'm part of a, a service with a gentleman who's sort of famous in the state among superintendents. His name is John Baglioni. Mm -hmm. And he hosts a superintendent's conference call in the morning. And then I collaborate with the Middlesex County superintendents. And then I'm on the phone with Bob. Mm -hmm. right, so Bob is on the road early. He's out there with Public Works and, and checking things out. And between those two groups and, and Bob, we're going to make the call. Um, I have to let uh, Nancy Bordenero know at m and before 5.30 in the morning. That's, okay. I'm sorry, 6.30 in the morning. That, that's, that's the latest she can know. So generally speaking, um, I'm going to be making the call usually, you know, 5.45, 6 or so. That is communicated out in an email and a voice message from me. Um, and then we communicate it out through the local news channels, TNH, WFSB, and, and others. Um, and then, of course, there are three types of closures. A closure, early dismissal, <coughs> and delayed. If anybody had any questions about how the decisions are made with respect to weather cancellations. Okay. All right, uh, two other quick ones. Um, 
So I got together with a newly formed committee, um, and I'm calling this right now the, the Teacher Recognition Committee. I, I, one thing I've always been a little disappointed here in Portland is that we don't do, we don't participate in the State Teacher of the Year program, and we really don't have any local programs or initiatives to recognize teaching excellence. Um, so I, I kind of kick-started this a little bit, and Eric has helped me, and Sue McDougall has helped me. So um, we're too late for Teacher of the Year this year, but I'm pushing this committee hard to get us back into the Teacher of the Year program. And I'd also like to do a more local one. Um, and again, whether it's monthly or quarterly or, or on a semester basis, we're putting together some ideas for how we might recognize teachers, and we're, we're colloquially calling it right now the gold pen recognition. So some way that we could just recognize teaching excellence and, you know, I, I see amazing things happening in the classroom every day. Um, I'll keep you posted on that. I hope you would support any endeavors we can make to recognize the outstanding teachers we have in the district. And then from this, I'd like to expand it to non-certified folks, too. So um, hopefully by the end of the year, we have it going, maybe a little pilot this year, but building on that future more ways that we can recognize certified and non-certified faculty and staff in the district and become part of the State Teacher of the Year program. That's wonderful. Thank you. Why, why did we not participate that in the past? I'm just curious, it was a decision made in the past and we withdrew from it or we just never? This is when I turn to Meg and say, mm -hmm. Meg. Um, <laughs> I, I think that um, people in classrooms find it difficult to prepare the documentation needed for teacher of the year and I know we had one very successful candidate that went all the way to nationals she was one of four finalists and she spent her her year and a half preparing data and documents and more documents it takes a lot I just read actually I just read 15 of the candidates for the 2022 teacher of the year through CAVE and it's incredible the amount of work that goes into it. And they're all outstanding. Every single one of them was a teacher of the year in their district, and now they're at the state level. And I believe there were 45 or, or almost 60 M people. When did Portland? Portland stopped about 10 years ago. And, and so, um, but I would like to see it initiated again, because I think it's worth it to recognize people for their um, outstanding, somebody like Karen, passion, um, mm -hmm. for sure. And we have a lot of people like that that would we be do. wonderful candidates for recognition at the local That's level true. with the golden pen. And we have yeah. lots of administrators, well, one administrator and several teachers in district who were teachers of the year in they other were. districts. Mm -hmm. right? and, yeah. and all of them I've spoken to talked about how certainly it's a lot of work if you choose to compete right. at the, the state or yeah. national level. You can choose mm -hmm. not to, yeah. too. Um, but all of them reflected on how valuable what that was as part of their careers. Mm -hmm. um, and th those accolades and recognitions yeah. are, you know, sort of... It, it recognizes nice excellence, and it also, um, it also promotes excellence within a district because they become role models and mentors for other people. Right. So it's, it's a win-win all the way around. So stay tuned. I'll have, I'll, I have a committee working on it. We're coming up with some guidelines. We'll, we'll be looking forward to sharing that with you, maybe piloting some things this year. But I think the more we can do to recognize Absolutely. Our folks, the better. That's yep. exciting. Absolutely. And then the last thing, um, I participated today, so I too seek out professional development opportunities. And I saw one from CREC this year that piqued my interest. It was a six part series focused on increasing educator diversity. Right? And I thought it sounded really interesting, so I signed up for it. I attended the first session today, it was about 8 to 11 30 this morning. Um, and it was really good. I was really happy that I signed up. It's a, it's a great group, small group, um, run by CREC, and they shared with us, what I, I, I put it in your uh, communications today, I just wanted you to see where we started, this guidebook for hiring, um, creating a district plan to increase the racial, ethnic, linguistic diversity of your educator workforce. Yeah. Um, so we started by reviewing this and, and getting <coughs> oriented to the work ahead of us this year. Um, but I, I'm just really excited about it, and um, certainly as I gather more information and really network with CREC and, and you know, figure out how we can you know, you know, certainly generate a, a larger pool, pool of more diverse candidates, um, I think that's going to be one of my big takeaways. But I'm looking forward to throughout the rest of the year working with you and Eric and the rest of the leadership team to make sure that we're doing everything we can to diversify our, our faculty and staff here in the district. I think we've taken some good steps in that direction with some of our more recent hires, but 
I do see this as an, an area for growth in the district. So I was, I was happy to be a part of that. I wanted to share this guidebook with you and I will keep you posted as I learn more throughout my forthcoming five sessions with that. Great, what an opportunity. Yeah, for sure. That's all I have. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Dawn, we've got our Director of Student Services here this evening for a report. And good evening, everybody. Good evening. Mm -hmm. Come on. And it is snowing outside. Little tiny snowflakes. <laughs> 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 we can start a rumor right away. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to turn to rain. I know. <laughs> Still something exciting about those first snowflakes, though. It's, it's, it is nice. My kids put um, white crayons in the freezer because that's the current superstition with kids is oh, white yeah. crayons in the freezer and okay. then oh, okay. ice cubes oh, yeah, down the toilet. That's, oh, that's how you oh, get a snow day. Oh, oh, oh. So no more pyj yeah. pajamas inside out or yeah. things like that. <laughs> hey, Mark the calendar for the day that you have yeah. the first go and yeah. then that's how many more you're going to have. Yeah. So we I will share this 30. report with you guys. Um, by email when I get uh, when I get back into the office tomorrow but I just I'm gonna go over some numbers around student services just to give you an update on where we are post October 1st and then I'm gonna talk about a con uh, an area of, of interest and concern for us here in Portland so um, first of all our numbers are pretty stable right now just like our numbers for enrollment uh, we have 247 students with IEPs 26 of those students by the way reside in Hartford I know some people have asked me for those numbers in the past um, 14 of those students are outplaced in approved private special ed programs or other LEAs because we don't have programming for them here. Two students are pending outplacement, so that number will most likely go up to 16 when we meet by the time we meet again. Um, 44 students in district are receiving services in one of our special programs. So those are the programs that we've been building systematically over the last six years, things like the ABA lab. Um, the RISE program at Gildersleeve, the Bridge program, the Harbor program, Life Skills. Um, we have 18 students in the referral process that could or could not, may or may not be added to the special ed roles in the next couple of weeks. We have 84 students with um, ap active 504 plans. We have two students, two of those students out of the 84 are residing in Hartford. And then we have 52 students that are English language learners, and that number's remained stable since the beginning of the year. So um, again, I'll put this all out to everybody. Any questions on that? I'd just like to give you an update mm -hmm. on where our numbers are trending every month because that, you know, that does have an effect upon both um, funding and programming and, and, and like that. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Pretty straightforward. Great, so now I'm gonna talk about something that's Usually I come in, I'm, I'm really upbeat and I'm talking about the great things that we love to talk about in, in student services, the innovative things our staff are doing or, or other, um, you know, some, some great programs that are being built or, you, you know, new activities. We'll get back to that next month. But Dr. Britton and I have been having some really good conversations about restraint and seclusion. There was um, an article in the paper and I shared the link when I, when I send you my update tomorrow. I shared the link to the article, and it, if you didn't see the article, it's, um, it's titled Connecticut, Connecticut Students Restrained, Secluded Thousands of Times, Causing Dozens of Injuries. Something's not working. And it's, you know, the article starts out telling a story of a young lady that went home after you know, a tough day at school, and she had bruises on her arm, and she was injured in a restraint incident at school, or, or restraint or, and or seclusion. And, and then the authors of the article went on to talk about statistics in Connecticut and what things look like. And then they also you know, spoke about things like deaths that have taken place in in when people are restrained and, and um, held against their will, um, especially when they're highly escalated. And you'd, all you have to do is turn on the news on a regular basis and we're seeing that, whether it's in schools um, with police and, 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 and um, individuals. So it is a very sensitive topic. And I cannot imagine, I thankfully never had that when my children were growing up, I never got that phone call that Mrs. Davis, we had to restrain your child today. So I can't even, I can't even understand what that feels like as a parent. But what, I, what that did cause us to do is to take a look at what are our policies, procedures, practices, and the history of restraint and seclusion in Portland. Because I'd love to stand up here and say we have never had to lay a, a hand on a child in the last six years that I've been here. But we know that that's not the case. There are times that dysregulation and, and upset in a student becomes so severe that an, an adult has to intervene. 
but what does that look like in Portland? So I wanted to be just be proactive and talk about what that does look like for us here in Portland. Um, so first of all, our staff and our faculty follow all state guidelines and laws regarding, regarding restraint and seclusion put forward by the, the CSTE. We don't negotiate any of that. There's guidelines we have to follow, and we follow those to the letter. And we have people that are specialized in that information so that they make sure when an incident happens that we're following everything to a T. Just this morning, I had a meeting with the Gildersleeve team. It's our monthly um, student services team meeting. And we were, we were talking through the procedure of <coughs> what do we do when a child has had an incident and they've had to be restrained and it just lasted a few seconds and then we let them, you know, every, everything de-escalated, the child was fine, we walk away and 10 minutes later it's happening again. Is that the same restraint or is that a new one? Um, what happens if we have them secluded and we're secluded for a few moments and then that we have to go into restraint? Is that one incident, is that two incidents? I love the conversation because it tells me that our staff is thinking about it so significantly and so concretely around every step of the way. So even though we continue to follow the guidelines, we're continuing to um, observe our practices. So first of all, the most important thing for us to realize and to recognize is resorts only, or, I'm sorry, restraint and seclusion is only used as a last resort when there's a case of imminent danger either to the child or to people around them. And by people around, I don't mean people that happen to be in the child's school, but people that are in the child's immediate, um, immediate area. Restraint and seclusion is only used by trained staff members. Several <coughs> years ago, we brought to, the, to you guys that we, um, we were going to engage in getting our staff PMT trained, and that's, that, that's the use of physical and psychological training interventions. Now we're to the point that we not only have our key staff members, anybody that might be part of a response team for a student, um, a student need, but we also have in-house a coach and a trainer that are part of our mental health team. That's Sarah um, McLaughlin and Kelsey Lisk. Our, our, Sarah's our trainer and Kelsey's our coach. So they're not only trainers of our staff, but they're key members of those students' care teams on a regular basis. Um, so all of, our, all of our staff, and even, even um, Ms. McLaughlin was trying to get Dr. Britton the other day into a class. I don't know if he actually made it or not. <laughs> I'm so, so on the list. <laughs> but she said, she says, come learn what it's about. Because PMT training is not six hours of training in how to use restraints. 60% of the program is de-escalation, social emotional de-escalation. We all know by our behavior, anytime we walk into a situation, we can make that situation go really positive, or we can go make it go really negative. We have a lot of power when we walk into a situation. You all do as parents, as spouses, as members of your community. So recognizing that and training our staff in, 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 in good de-escalation techniques before you get even get to having to lay hands on a child is really important. Um, that team also, that, that PMT training team also works a lot when we when we have had an incident of a child being escalated, it helps us debrief as well to talk about what did we do right, what did we maybe we need to improve upon or need to focus on for the next time. Because it's that one of those things, you, it's just kind of like calling an ambulance. You never want to know that, you never want to have to use it, but if you do, you want to know that it's going to get to the right place at the right time and do the right thing. So that's, that's where we are with our de-escalation training. Um, so we have, I, I believe right now we're about 35 staff members across the district are PMT trained. So it's quite a few people and it's just because you don't know um, people move in and out of children's programs and they, they move around school so we just keep as many people trained as possible. Training is annual. The first time you go through a training it's six hours and that's probably why we haven't gotten Dr. Britton into it yet because <laughs> it's a six hour commitment. Um, re retraining or refreshing every year is a three hour class. Um, the next thing to know about restraint and seclusion in Portland is every single incident is monitored by both an administrator and a school nurse, a medical personnel. That's, that's part of the state guidelines. <coughs> but those people are not part of the restraint those pe or the seclusion. They are not part of any of the inter interactions with the student. All they are there to do is to monitor to make sure everything's going well. We all know when we're in the middle of something, we have tunnel vision. We're focused on what if, whatever it is we're trying to get done. So that person monitoring, both, both the administrator for monitoring the scene, as well as the, um, the nurse to make sure that everybody is safe, and especially the child that is um, in, in the, the product of a restraint or a seclusion is healthy and not injured in any way. So in those incidents, um, 
Um, and those, the, uh, again, those incidents are monitored completely from start to finish until the child's completely de-escalated and returned either back to their classroom setting or they're returned back to um, maybe perhaps they go home or <coughs> they take some time out in the nurse's office or something like that. The other piece to this is every single incident has to be reported. So, um, and, and it's funny because if you look at, at district's data, because uh, in preparation for our talk today, I, I've looked at our data for the last 10 years because it's all on a state website and it's, you know, it's in a portal. How many students did the, um, the number of students, the number of restraints, any injuries, any um, restraints that go more than 90 minutes because that puts it into like a, a, a higher category. Any seclusions that go higher than 90 minutes. All of that information gets put into the state database and monitored. And, and they look at it on a, you know, the, the state looks at it on a regular basis. Um, the year following the pandemic shutdown, wh when they audited everybody's data, they, I, I got a letter from them, I, they said, either there's a mistake or you have to figure out some reason to explain for it because in, in one year's time, your restraints and seclusion dropped tremendously and, and it was outside the realm of typical. And so I had to do a good analysis of our data for the next year or for, for that year to be able to explain why it dropped. Well, part of it was we were out of school for four months. The other part of it was that um, we've, you know, building up some of the programs that we've built up has helped alleviate some of that the escalation and some of that social emotional need. But looking at the data, that was a good, in, a good example. Um, but it also made me feel good because I know that people at the state level are looking at the information we're putting in. We're not just putting it into a bucket just to, you know, to follow a lot of chats. The reality is it, it, gets, it gets monitored and discussed. So everything does have to be, um, the, in those th that reporting has to be done within 24 hours. A copy of the report goes home to the parent. And the parents are typically notified right away by phone. And some of our children that have had multiple restraints and seclusions, the parents are part of the de-escalation plan. I was observing today, it wasn't a restraint seclusion, it was just a child that was really escalated and, and his team was working around him. But part of the plan was when you get to this certain level, we're gonna sit down and call mom so you can talk with mom and tell her how you're doing. Because that's, for some kiddos, that, 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 that ability to be tied into their parents at that time of crisis is really helpful. So, um, but if, if the parent's not part of the phone, part of the incident at the time, they're notified within, um, usually before the child goes home, and the they receive the report in writing um, within, um, within 24 hours. With the new CT SETS program, now the reports are filed through CT SETS, so we don't have to go to a separate platform and do that. And that is, um, that's done, you know, by the, by the close of the day. And it's inputted by the person that, that carried out the restraint that person that was in charge of it, and then it's overseen and signed off either by myself or one of the school principals. Okay? Any questions so far? I'm kind of throwing a lot of information at us. All right. Um, the next thing is if a student has four or more restraints within 30 days, we go to PPT because something's not working. Anytime we have a restraint or a seclusion, something's breaking down in the system. And it's whether it's our response, the child's needs are changing, whatever it is, something's breaking down. So we've got to come back and, and take a look at the child's plan. Um, that is a state requirement, and we monitor that very carefully. Make sure we're into PPTs right away. Uh, and sometimes, if a child's really escalating to the point that you know they may need to go to a higher, you know, higher level of care or a more ther therapeutic program, that might mean we're having one PPT a week because that's how quick the the, the incidents are happening but that's what we do to make sure that we're um, meeting the child's needs. Uh, one thing to note is that the guidelines for reporting, the, the type of things that had to be reported and how they were reported changed significantly <coughs> in the, in the night, between 17, 18, and 1920. Those two school years, there was significant legislative changes over the summer that changed how we reported. Um, and, when, and, and that across the board, we saw major bumps in the number of seclusions and restraints that were reported by districts during those two years. Each event now is counted as a separate restraint or seclusion. We can't say Johnny had a bad day so he spent the day in seclusion and counted as one, one, one incident. If Johnny escalated and then de-escalated and then escalated again and, and if he did that four times throughout the day that can be four restraints and seclusions in one day. So the, the number of incidents has risen up. Um, and then the other thing that changed is what's called a restraint or seclusion. 
And one thing I can remember from when my children were little is there were times I would, you know, we're walking across the parking lot and my four-year-old wants to run and he's, he's not in a good place and he wanted to run. I would take him by his hand and I would restrain him. I would hold on to him till we got to the other side of the parking lot because that's what moms and dads do. That's fine for moms and dads, but when we do that in school, that's holding a child against their will. Now, if I put my hand down and I'm walking with our lovely preschoolers and I see somebody wants to take my hand or they look like they need to take <laughs> my hand, we'll hold hands and we'll walk, but I'm not holding that child against their will. If somebody is holding a child, whether it's a, a um, you know, from, to move from one place to another, to, be, to move to a safer environment, <coughs> that's still considered a restraint and that has to be documented. It's a matter of data collection, so it does have to be collected. Um, the other thing <coughs> is, sometimes we have somebody that's just pretty escalated and they want to bolt from the situation. They want to run away. Closing the door and not allowing them to leave is considered seclusion. Yeah. If, if, if Tim's in my class and Tim's having a temper tantrum, sorry Tim, you're just right here. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Tim's having a tantrum and he's really not safe, but the best thing for us to do is to let him have some space and let him be on his own. I'm not going to take Tim down the hall and have, have him, you know, parade his, his dysregulation in front of everybody. I may ask the rest of my class to leave and then sit with Tim for a while. Well, if Tim then decides, wait a minute, now I'm mad, I want to go with my class because they're going to gym and i got to stand here with you, but I don't let them go, let Tim go because it's not safe. That now becomes a seclusion. Yeah. So all of those things are written up and they're documented. It is good data. It tells us what's not working with the child's program. But I wanted to make sure that people, just, just you guys as a board, because that, that report was, I'm sure there's people that went home and said, is this happening at my child's school? My child can be a nudge at home. Is my child being restrained and secluded and nobody's telling me what's going on here? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to just kind of get in front of this and talk about what our practices are here in Portland. Um, in the last four, I, I do have the data in this report for the last four years. And over the last four years, um, beginning with eight, uh, the 18-19 school year. The 18-19 school year, we had 79 incidents of restraint and seclusion. It involved eight students. <coughs> In 19-20, we had 19 incidents of restraint and seclusion. This is where the state called me up and said, what are you guys doing in Portland? <laughs> mm. um, again, still eight students, but it was a significant drop. In 2021, we had 49 incidents of, incidents of restraint and seclusion, and that included nine different students. And in 21-22, we had 48 incidents of restraint and seclusion, and that included nine different students. And one thing I want to point out, when I say eight students in 18-19, um, eight students in 19-20, these are not the same eight students. Johnny is not being restrained from third grade all the way up to, fifth, to sixth grade. These are different students every year because if a student is having that much difficulty that they're having to be restrained, and <coughs> restrained or secluded, we're looking for a higher level of care. <coughs> That's why we've come for programs like the RISE program and the Bridge program, Harbor at the middle school, high school. Um, so that it's important to see those numbers for what they are but also recognize that with most students, we watch an extinction. We watch, and the extinction either happens because we're able to wrap the programming around them here and have them be successful. Sometimes it's a medical intervention or, or a psychiatric intervention, but we're able to do something to get that child back to baseline. And also, please note, anytime we outplace a student to another um, program, to a state-approved um, private program, their restraints and seclusions of the child there, if they happen there, also get reported for us. So if I send a student to Intensive Education Academy in West Hartford, but he's a Portland student, and he has a restraint or the, and or a seclusion where he's at, that still goes on our, our accounting. So it's, all, it, it's not like if somebody's struggling, we send them to an outplacement and those numbers go away. It's still part of our data. Do you, okay. does your data break that down if we have outplaced mm -hmm. students yeah. versus see that in your report? Um, all I have in my report for you guys here is just this information here. I didn't go into that depth as to what who's outplaced and things like that. That would take just just deeper a deeper look at everything. It just would be interesting to see if, you know, versus students in 
in the school system versus outplaced, mm -hmm. and, and where that you know seventy nine incidents in two thousand eighteen nineteen, how many of those were in house and how many were outplaced? And right, and right. Well, when I was looking at that number, because that was that's that's a few years ago for me. You know, that's that's that's, that's five years ago now. One of the things I was looking at is you you go through you, you have a child that's starting out they're they're having difficulty and then they escalate to a point where you know we're the, the team is looking at the, at the situation we're talking with the parents we're talking about what type of program this child needs and especially when we didn't have the spaces for kids that are exhibiting these types of behaviors this is going on in the hallways this is going on in the um, you know in, in the in the office. And so that child will have a whole bunch of restraints and seclusions. Typically, we see it fall off when we outplace because they're going into a very specialized, very small program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and do you break down the data at all, um, like emergency versus program? I'm not using old knowledge from years ago. I don't know if there, but we, there used to be a clear distinction between emergency intervention restraints versus programmatic. If somebody had a program that indicated under certain circumstances, you would take their hand and you would maybe, you know, Restrain it temporarily, but that would, that's a restraint, but it's not an emergency restraint. So I'm going to age us a little bit. Yeah. If we if we had if it was pre 1819, we would we would break that data out. But really, after about 1819, we were not supposed to have and restraint and seclusion should not be part of anybody's program. So oh okay, so it, yeah, it, so it has, everything I now. Was, is, yeah. I wasn't sure. I figured that may be the case. Yeah, 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 and that's that's it exactly because it used to be, you know, many years yeah, back. Yeah, Distinction. Yeah, if, if somebody exhibited X behavior, the plan, part of their behavior intervention plan was they went into, you know, into a timeout room and, and they locked the door for 30, you know, for 30 right. minutes or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, now, of course, and, and I will tell you, our time for our restraints and seclusions are measured in minutes, sometimes fractions of minutes. I signed off on a restraint and seclusion the other day, it was one and a half minutes. But our staff is conscientious and honest. If I put my hands on a student mm -hmm. against their will, this is now a restraint. So it's not like we've never had any cases of any inc any incidents of injury, and we have never had any um, restraints. And during the six years I've been here, that's really mm -hmm. the data I've looked at. Um, we we have had no cases that have gone over ninety minutes. So they're all they're all short in nature. That's good to hear, Don. Can I ask this? There's been a lot of conversation at the state level over the last few years that I've been aware of around teachers um, and staff members getting injured during restraint incidences. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm curious whether, um, what, what rate that might be happening in Portland and what supports we have for our students to keep them, and for our staff members to keep them safe as well. Yeah, it's a great question because that's something that Dr. Britton and I are looking at, we're looking at through the PMT process is um, it's, the injuries are not so much taking place during the restraint and seclusion because that's a very controlled environment. <coughs> it's typically what's leading up to it. Okay. Um, and that's one of the things that we're learning is teaching the people that are not PMT trained um, to make sure that they are keeping themselves safe and just backing away and, and clearing the other students away from a dangerous situation to let the person come in that's trained. So first thing is de-escalation training, just moving away, protecting yourself, protecting the others around you. Um, the other part of it is we've really expanded the number of people that are PMT trained. Um, uh, but sometimes it does happen. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen, you know, especially when it's not expected. You know, when somebody's angry and lashes out mm -hmm. and they, you know, and something goes flying or a, a foot goes flying and it kicks somebody, it can be, and when it's unexpected, it's injurious. Mm -hmm. um, and it's injurious both physically and emotionally. Sure. That's, that's, the big, that's the other part of it. Um, a big part of my, my professional goals this year for, you know, for, from, from um, that, that view is looking at how do teachers feel about their safety. Two years ago, teachers and safety were talking about COVID. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, that's getting behind us and now it's really time to look at do I feel physically safe in my environment? Mm. with students that can de-escalate, that can go from <laughs> zero to 60. And what can we do about that? How are you gonna collect that data from teachers and staff members? Probably mostly survey. I mean, that, that's what we're work, working mm -hmm. on right now is a baseline survey. Mm -hmm. um, and it, along the lines of what we're doing with Panorama, but really this is targeting folks that are dealing with these types, with these students, with these needs. Um, and what the last decision I have to make is, we're, you know, are we going to survey all staff or just staff that's working directly with students with explosive behaviors. Hmm. So. 
but it's just, and, and you know, it'll tie in with the data that we collect at the end of the year through the panorama survey, but I really want to get at the nitty gritty of what is feeling safe at school now. We're not worried so much about wearing masks and our kids can keep yeah. their masks on. We're worried about explosive behavior. What does that and, mean? And it can affect everybody, including the lunchroom and custodians. It could, you know, so it probably would be a good thing to do all staff just because those kids do not just keep it in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. and if you're hearing, you know, a, a, howl, a hollering child in the hallway, and that child sounds angry, and, yeah. and you know, you've got an, especially because we all come to school with different a different background, and That's so uh, for some people, adults that have dealt with violence or, or um, injury in their past, yeah, it's That's significant PTSD. Yeah. So that's the data. Like I said, it's not my typical. I'm usually talking about great stuff for building and things like that. This is important housekeeping, but it's also, I think it's important for you guys to, um, you know, just to hear what we're doing. I, I can't sweep it under the rug and say it doesn't happen in Portland. It does happen, but the reason that it happens is for, for protection and safety of, of the student especially. Quite often when we have children in, that are in such a rage like this, they're injurious to themselves. They're mm -hmm. outside their bodies and they're doing things to hurt themselves. Um, the, other, uh, the other part, you know, and it's nice that Bob's in the room, is we've had good conversations this year with um, our, our um, emergency, ser emergency service responders, first mm -hmm. responders, because we want to make sure that when they get to the building, if we have to call for an ambulance, because sometimes we have to call for an ambulance, sometimes we have to call for mobile psych services mm -hmm. and call in a behavioral emergency. So when those folks get to the building, that we have a good handoff between our staff and, and, and the people that might be involved in a restraint or a seclusion going to the, um, the EMS providers or the police officers that show up first to help us. How is the mobile crisis response? I know that the legislation now has made it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and includes school um, response yeah. time. No, yes? I'm, I'm seeing 45 minutes to an hour and a half. So it's, it's still long. Okay. It's, I mean, res it's, re it's about resources. I think everybody's doing the best they possibly can, but it's about resources. So okay. um, if we have a child that's truly that escalated, we're going to talk with the parent and we're going to call 911 and see to get them to, um, uh, you know, to the hospital. And sometimes it, what happens is the parent shows up and that brings the child back down. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, we've had incidents where the ambulance gets there, and the parent says, "No, I'm, you know, he's he's back to normal. Let me take him home. Let mm -hmm. me take him to his doctor, and let me do that." And and so it sometimes happens in that way as well. Do we ask parents with kids who have escalated behavior or mental health issues have they called mobile crisis in the past? Is that child known to the mobile crisis unit? That's usually known by, if it's somebody that, yeah. that, that has a yeah. known behavioral need, yeah. that's usually yeah. known by the clinicians in the building. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, so whether important. they have case management mm -hmm. or something else by mobile site, you know, by, by yeah. outside providers. That, that helps sometimes to move things more quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. All right. Well, Don, uh, I'm really appreciative that you brought this conversation to us, and I guess I'm, uh, you know, one of our board goals this, this year, continued from last year, is around this, the supporting the social and emotional health and wellness of our students, but also our, our faculty and staff, and so I would be very curious, or I'd be interested to have you bring back the, the data after you gather that this year and share that with us about how our, how our faculty and staff are doing and, you know, what your recommendations are to keep right. folks safe. Are there any other questions or comments for Don? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Don. I'll email this out to you guys so it has some information. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Thank Thanks you. Don. All right. Um, that brings us to new business. And uh, we've got a couple policies here. First, policy 3523.11 unmanned aerial systems. It's our updated drone policy. And I would recommend that we uh, approve that tonight because we have students at the high school with um, Dylan who are chomping at the bit to learn how to use that drone, drone and sooner rather than later. So um, yeah. that's a Did language update. Yeah, Did you we, we, have, we have Dylan here tonight here? too as our, one of our tech guy teachers. Yes. So if you remember last spring, um, Eric Martin and Dylan gave us a presentation and talked a little bit about some of the changes. One of the ones most notably being is that there is no longer an FAA test that students can take. Um, 
So we need to update our policy to, to reflect some of those things that are no longer available. Um, of course, you know, this policy reflects the fact that a any students operating the drone will be doing so as part of Dylan's programming, um, as part of you know, his, his courses and his extracurricular activities. And Dylan has worked very closely with Eric and, and with me to make sure that, that this both complies with changes to, to um, current statutes or what are offered by FAA and other. other um, and Dylan is certified as a drone operator. So sure. with that certification, you can train through an educational process students, which right. is exciting. So, so they're pretty relatively simple changes here. We just have to, to strike that part, which is in red, with which and been vetted by a, a TSA thing, because that doesn't exist, right? So we have, we have to t take that out. Right. And then we, we wanted to strike the language that says 17 years of age, um, because mm -hmm. we, we do want some of our freshmen and, and sophomores to, to be able mm -hmm. to do this. Um, and then, of course, you know, we added the um, students operators may only operate under the supervision of a qualified PHS faculty, which certainly Dylan is. And then everything else is, is Oh, the one other thing is we, we can't go steal plays at games or anything. So right. you can't fly them over the, <laughs> the opposing over. football team and figure out where the linebackers <laughs> set up. Exactly. Or whatever they want to do. So we, we did put that in there. Yep, um, yep. Otherwise, I, Dylan, did you have any comments? We're pretty comfortable that, that this you know matches what Dylan's doing, and otherwise we'll give our students the opportunity to fly the drone in safe ways. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Dylan? Right. I believe the policy committee felt comfortable with this policy as it is. The changes were pretty minimal. Did everyone have an opportunity to read mm -hmm. through them? Mm -hmm. um, I know the hope was to, I know typically we do two readings, but the hope was to be able to, to perhaps yeah. vote on this if everybody yeah. agreed that they felt comfortable with that in order to get a policy in place so Dylan and his students can use the technology that we have. Yeah, yeah and I think you know, we, it, it's kind of almost a second reading because we had they a whole presentation on it. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't remember what date that was, but it feels like May. Yeah. <laughs> but, it um, was May. But yeah, we did go through and we looked at the whole yeah. thing, and I, it is, I, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Does everyone feel comfortable with that just by taking a kind of poll of the room? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, since that's the case, I'll uh, make a motion to accept the uh, policy 3523.11 unmanned. Aerial systems, drones, and uh, forego the first reading and approve it tonight so that it is in place for our students. We will forego the second reading. Right, right. we'll forego the second reading. Right. Right. Perfect. Is there yeah, a second? second? Thank you. Did I say yeah. first reading? Thank you, Meg, and thank you, Tim. Um, <laughs> Good. Any further discussion about the policy? No. All right, all in Let favor? Them. Aye. Keep them safe out there, Dylan. Let them know. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right, uh, then we can move along to policy 6163.33, therapy dogs. And uh, Charles will give us a little synopsis, but we have it on here as a, a, new, policy a new policy first reading because there was some due diligence done since the last time that's we looked at it. Right. It's a so, new document. Yes, that's right. So if you remember, we did talk about this, and I think the same night as the drone policy, as a mm -hmm. matter of fact. Um, we had a CABE model policy that was um, part of their recommendations, and the policy committee had looked at that. and then. As part of the first read, the conversation was had. Has the question was asked? Has this been reviewed by our Shipman and Goodwin, Rebecca, our legal team, and otherwise, is there any concerns that our insurance carrier might have about this? Right. So, I, I took that feedback, went back, shared it with Rebecca. She shared it with the people at Shipman and Goodwin who do this, and uh, that then yielded this policy, which is a little different than the one that was the first read. The first read. Um, Specifically, I like this one better. The policy committee talked it over. There's a, a, a more clarification about if somebody's, the process by which somebody can request to bring a, a therapy dog into the schools and then that they have to show the certification and the certificate of insurance that they're then responsible for that dog's behavior while they're here. I think that satisfies the board's concerns about um, liability risk, issues yeah. and it's a tighter policy. So mm -hmm. we, we looked it over in the policy committee. I appreciate Rebecca and Shipman and Goodwin vetting this for us, and um, there it is. So if you want to, I don't think we need to take action on it right now, but. No, uh, I think we'll we wait and have it on the agenda yeah. at our next meeting on December 6th to give it its full well, attention. Yeah. Um, so if there are you know questions or comments or 
anything you can ask for now, but we'll have a couple more weeks to look it over. I did notice one thing, Charles, that we get page two, um, such a certification registration shall be from oh, the organization. I think we do need to fill that blank in. Yeah. Where is that? On the yeah. second page, it's in bold. The name of the organization that yeah. uh, would be certifying. Okay. Um, but oh, yeah, the, po yeah, the policy committee, I think, felt oh, that um, given that there is some use of therapy right. dogs currently in the district, that it would be a good idea for us to have a policy in place that it was warranted. Um, it is. So, yeah. yeah. Good. Oh, Were there any one. questions or thoughts? No. no, no, no. The only thing that got my attention a little bit was the allergies and aversions mm -hmm. and um, asking the owner or handler to remove the dog. Um, if there's somebody who suffers allergies or aversions and it talks about spaces and I'm just trying to imagine what that would look like and who would be the person charged with having to ask them in what situations and what does mm -hmm. that look like then for the person who brought the therapy dog you know um, it's kind of that same thing with a child with allergies in the lunchroom and who's being asked to leave or not leave or sit at a certain table so right. I'm wondering how that would be handled that's a, it's a good question. Is that something that we think would be handled in a regulation? Um, well, likely y y the, the form that the, the therapy dog handler fills out and submits would have to be reviewed by me and the principal. And then, you know, for the most part, the way I envision the therapy dogs being used is, is it wouldn't be, if you don't want, if you have allergies, <laughs> I mean, if my son has allergies and we don't want him because we have to notify the parents that this is happening, right. we, this, the student would not be forced to be with the, the, do right. the dog. And we wouldn't bring the dog into the area where the child who has allergies would otherwise have to learn for the rest of the day. So, I mean, I think there would be a, a matter of saying, hey, we're going to bring in the therapy dog. For those of you who want to visit with the therapy dog, you know, please do. For those of you who are allergic, don't and then we won't we won't subject you to those allergens by bringing the dog in. Mm. Um, but that would have to be something we'd have to be mindful and careful of. And so hopefully you, know, you preempt that with right. the with the paperwork, with the which we don't currently have in that. place. Yeah. So that's yeah, correct. and the notification. And the notification. And the notification. Yeah. And then of course generally, right. generally in small groups or um, they're used by counselors with with one on one or two right. kids at a time. So it's not like a, a dog visiting a classroom like when they had gerbils and other furry animals that were causing allergies to, to kids. Yeah. Right, and then of course, you know, the, the, the second layer of this, now that I think through that, that question is, you know, our nurses would need, well, are aware of students who suffer from peanut allergies. I'm not sure, there probably is, I'm just not sure of any, you know, students who get seriously sick from, from a dog, but there may be, well, there right? Could be. You know, students who get seriously sick from, from a dog, but there may be, oh, there right? Could be. Uh, likely oh, it is. You know, I, I don't know, but that we likely have some students who could get yeah. very sick from the dander or whatever mm -hmm. the dog might bring in. Our nurses would know that yeah. and, and would likely be saying, can't have the dog on anywhere in this building within a thousand yards of this place <laughs> because of that student. Yeah. So you know, I think that what this does, which is nice, is it makes us all very mindful of who's coming when and, and how the dog is being brought into the building and then looping the nurse into that conversation and the parents and the students into that conversation before the dog comes. And I think that this sets up a protocol for that. And I, I, what I like about the language too is that I think it, I, I think the language is pretty clear in prioritizing the safety and well-being of our students over the presence of a dog in the schools. So I, you know, if a dog is in the school and I've gone through all the paperwork and everything is by the books, but we have a child who has a severe fear of dogs because they've had a prior dog bite. I think that if there were any sign of student discomfort that the, the policy very clearly instructs staff members to prioritize keeping our students well and safe. Agreed. Parents have to sign the agreement as well so that I mean, it would be that if you were going to bring it into a classroom, the entire class of parents would have to sign that agreement. So I think it kind of precludes just random visits and exposing everybody to allergens. So if I understand when this policy is in place and implemented that the only dogs that would be in the school would be a certified therapy dog. Certified and certified. insured. And insured, yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Correct. Yeah. 
It is complicated. We want to make sure we get it right. Yeah. So give it a read and more questions next time. And if mm -hmm. you're comfortable with, with the language as is, great. If not, we can yep. make amendments. Yeah, and I would say if anybody has any thoughts or other concerns, additional concerns or questions between now and the next meeting, feel free to send them along to Charles and the policy mm -hmm. committee can be sure to, to take a look at the policy again if we need to. Mm -hmm. All right, any other thoughts or questions about that? No. Nope. All right, uh, 2023 Board of Education meeting dates. It's that time of year again, so I um, have in the folder the draft suggestion for um, meeting dates starting pretty consistent with past calendars um, with our, our budget meetings, and then you, you see them laid out there. Um, Can I ask a quick question about the October meetings? <laughs> I think this year we moved our October meetings from the first and third, Tuesday to the second and fourth because of um, yeah, Yom Shippur. Yeah. Um, okay. But I don't believe in 2023 that 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 Yom Kippur overlaps with any. I believe it's in September. As a matter October. of fact, it's interesting. We are just starting the discussion this week about the district calendar. I think I have it right here in my inbox. Let me pull okay. that up. Good idea. I'm just wondering if yeah, there was a compelling check. reason to have it on the second and fourth Tuesdays. Then that's not an issue. I just think consistency with first and third, if we can, is probably a good idea. Trish, did you, did you have the, you know, although I don't know, we just have the calendar, we don't have the, um, No, it should be on the, the, the staff calendar. Okay. Yes. Correct. <coughs> District calendar. So, Yom Kippur is Tuesday, October 4th, Wednesday, October 5th. That's this year. That's this year. Well, yeah. Yeah. Next we year don't it's have this year. It's in year. September next year. September 14th and 15th. I think that's Rosh Hashanah. Is that Rosh Hashanah? What's, what's, what's Yom Kippur? I think it's the 20 something. Google? Oh. <coughs> it says the 2023 Rosh Hashanah. Is <laughs> Sunday, 16th. September 24th is Yom Kippur in 2023. And it ends on Monday, September 25th. Yeah, there you go. So does that. And what about It does Rosh not Hashanah? conflict with September, September or October yeah. dates. Good. Okay. Yeah. And what and Rosh Hashanah. I didn't early. know if there was a different reason why the October dates were pushed later. And Rosh Hashanah is September fifteenth and September seventeenth. Yeah, because yeah, okay. this year so we only had one state in so October okay. repeated. Right? Right. 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 Well, uh, Sometimes, well, they come relatively close within remember. 10 days of each other or eight I days of each other, but we missed them. I mean, next year it's the 15th for Yom Kippur or for Rosh Hashanah, and then. Um, we had one on. I think we typically do two October meetings. We do. We do Correct, on the 25th. Yeah. So that's why 10th and 25th. Yeah, is I figured one day. we moved it because that's of right. Yom Kippur this year, but I don't think. Mm. I think the holidays, the Jewish holidays, don't impact our October meetings in 2023, so we might wish to go back to the first and third <coughs> Tuesdays. So that what you're saying is we would, would change that to, let me go forward to the Change that to 10, 3, 3 and March, April, May, October. 17. October, 3 and 17. October. So we could go to the 3rd and 17th and as opposed to the 10 and 24th. Right. I, I think that might be, for consistency's sake, I think that might make sense. And, that, and, that, right? and the, the third, third and the, the third and the seventeenth would not interfere with any. They don't in not neither of the Jewish holiday of the fall no. Jewish holidays are in, in October. Good. Trisha, are you following all that? <laughs> so. in and, yeah. and they're in so. September, but it's not impacting. They do not our, overlap with the September meetings. So what I hear either. is the yeah. recommendation is instead of the make it the third, instead of the twenty fourth, make it the seventeenth for next right. year. That would be my suggestion, unless there was a reason not to. No, I, I think that's fine. Yeah. Okay. No. okay. Stacy, good with that? I'm good with that. You got that noted? Good. So we'll have to um, adjust that before we send it to Ryan tomorrow. Okay. Somebody passes tonight. Okay. I, I, I will not be able to attend the March 7th meeting, but I don't think that's a reason to change the schedule around. I'm just mentioning that. Okay. Were there any, any other, anything else that anybody noticed in the schedule that needed attention? Fourteenth is my anniversary, so <laughs> 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 I 
but they maybe probably will meeting. not we'll be see how that works out. Right. September 5th is my anniversary, is too. It? It's yeah. on there. Um, <laughs> it's like, you're going to hit something, right? That's funny. Yeah, yeah. Birthdays and anniversaries. And, yeah. So we make a motion to accept the calendar for 2023 as presented with the uh, minor change of October meetings being um, changed to uh, October 3rd and October 17th. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, any further discussion? Nope. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you all. And that brings us to the big ticket item tonight yes. item D heating, venting, and air conditioning grant. And all the hard work that Charles and Stephanie have been putting into this. All right, and Bob. And Bob. Bob. No, thank you for being here, Bob. Bob. <laughs> um, all right. So wh why don't we why don't we start with with that that Bob is here. Do do you have any questions? I know we've gone over it, and I emailed you all of the recommendations from Perfect Temp and mm -hmm. a lot of information about the air handling units and what they do. Do you have any questions about the scope of the project or what we're recommending as far as in this this? Potential for a grant because Bob has done. I can't thank him enough. Thank gosh, we have him. It is wonderful. <laughs> he has done a ton of work on this and, and can answer any infrastructure-related questions far better than I could. I know it warms the air and then pushes it into the building. Of steam. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my. I think maybe it would be helpful, Bob, just because there when. During our meeting yesterday with First Selectman Curley, there were some questions about whether or not this is the best way forward and why these particular units are necessary. So I, I think it maybe would be valuable for you to just give us a quick overview about why these are the units we need and why this is the best path forward. Well, this, if I understand that this is all of the units. So that, yeah. Correct. All the rooftop units. So when the, the grant was basically notified that, you know, that they're going to be awarding or the money was made available. It was as early as, you know, June or July. Charles put a target right on that and said, you know, this is something that we really need to look at. Um, in particular, because of all the, um, you know, the issues that we, we face um, during that period of the year um, at that secondary complex. Um, and we maintain that very well, but it's difficult. Um, you know, to keep that environment the way we feel it needs to be for the students as well as making sure that the building um, and the things that are in it are maintained well. And that all has to do with its climate. Um, it works the same way at your home. So uh, what we did look at was, you know, the age. And, you know, we're getting up into the 18-year, 19-year mark, rooftop um, units. Some say have a 25-year um, service life. Most of these are around 20, 22 years. We've had many problems and we've made and, and made many repairs um, to our rooftop units. But in particular, the, the way that we're trying to better the climate in the buildings is to add dehumidification, which is a really big part of respiratory health. So we're looking to advance that in a building that was built almost 20 years ago and new technology has changed an awful lot. So the rooftop units now um, that are being made with new technology have the ability to dehumidify as well. Not only do they do that, but as I researched and studied a little more deeper, um, economizers are something that is not very new, but it is becoming state of the art. And the economizer is a way that these rooftops preheat and pre-cool air um, at the same time, which helps save energy. So we're trying to do both here, which is, um, you know, you certainly don't, when you're dehumidifying, it's, there's a cost um, as part of that. And Laurel, you probably know with the library, you know, we happen I to do. use the you know, <laughs> library for, for years that I managed that system there, you know, we noticed energy costs are very high in the summer months, but because we're using heat um, to dehumidify, uh, you know, to keep the books and the environment there. Same thing um, anywhere you're dehumidifying. So with the economizer engineering portion of it, it helps offset that additional cost um, that you can recognize when you know, you're know you dehumidifying with units at the same time because you're using heat. Fortunately, when that school was built, the chiller 
which is a very large uh, unit which is used for a good portion of the school as well, was not set up to do that. It's a two-pipe system, which you need a four-pipe system, which you have a return not only of your chiller water, but your heating water at the same time. So in the summer months, you're actually using your furnaces as well as your chiller <coughs> um, to do that, and that dehumidifies at the same time. To accomplish that portion of um, this work is a big, big deal because you're running pipe into areas that, you know, could have or should have or maybe would have been a lot easier to do when the building was under construction. But this, all rooftop units, 17 of them, we have proposed and we will quickly write the grant. And I'll tell you, this grant is, uh, I've written a lot of grants, I've looked at a lot of grants and provided a lot of material for grants and this is probably one of the most aggressive time frames that I've ever seen. So um, with that said, we got our information. We studied, uh, spent an awful lot of time studying, working with our contractor who spent an awful lot of time with me. They probably don't like me too much. <laughs> but uh, they, they came to the, to the carpet with some good numbers and we, we, we came up with what we think is a great plan. And if we're able to move forward and can find the funding to make this happen and then we're successful enough to be awarded, I think it's a great start to improving the the climate at the school. <clears throat> um, we'll be able to dehumidify the air. We're doing a lot of things now to try to help that and there's some damper controls and we had talked about that in the meeting and we do that now with our consultant um, that we have on board. I manually do those on a daily basis which is controlling outside airflow inside when it's very humid and trying to cut that source off. The problem is you're recirculating and you're re still recirculating that damp and moist air. You want to heat it, you want to get that moisture out of it, and you want to recirculate that cleaner, better environment air into the school. So I think with that said, this is what that is. There's tonnage involved. Each rooftop unit's a different size based on the area that it handles. So that's what the tonnage is about. If you look at the detail on that, each one, there's so many that are 20 tons, so many that are 10. So it's, it's what we feel that's going to, and, and Charles put, it perfectly saying it's a it's not a hundred percent fix but it's surely going to make a difference based on what we see now and we know that complex is going to be there for some time so i think personally you know after looking at this in depth that we we have i think this is a great opportunity for us to make a move and and just to be clear the the perfect fix would be the four pipe system but installing Installing that, we're talking millions and millions of dollars and huge disruption. Right. Yeah, Correct. that's a big disruption. That's a, and that's phase two. The rooftop units would still need to be done, right. and then the chiller side of that, that supplies different portions of the school, would eventually have to be done. So, yeah, you're you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars just for the chiller, mm -hmm. and then hundreds of thousands of dollars in disruptions. You know that we'll have to plan for to get that piping. Um, alongside the other piping that currently goes to those sections of the school so and even were we to do that at some point in the future we would still need to replace these these seal uh, these uh, roof units absolutely and so we have the opportunity to do it now with some state funding correct which right. is a, it's a wonderful grant it's it's great that they've seen the the need for this um in the state and we just hope that uh you know we're successful mm -hmm. Questions for Bob about the quote from Perfect Temp or about these units mm -hmm. in particular? Well, are there, are there other alternatives that could be, if we can't go for the, I think it was the 18? 17. 17 units, yeah. sorry. Yeah, 17. Yeah. If we can't accomplish 17 units, is there a number of units below that that would help get us, like bridge us toward where we want to be? Or is yeah. this it? It's either we put in 17 units or it's not worth doing. No, it's no, absolutely anything's worth doing. Uh, so, so our $200,000. Where we have to be based on where our funding ends up is I think what we'll have to look at changing. Um, you know, at first we looked at nine or 10, but when we got deep into the numbers and I was able to analyze the first estimates that came to me, we found some opportunity to make changes, plus we found some numbers that were inadvertently put into the overall package, which we thought was very high, that I said, no, that shouldn't be in there, mm -hmm. which was the chiller. 
So we came down to a very realistic, very good number with contingency, and it ended up being the number that we have to replace them all. If we have to come down from there, we would have to pick the strategically pick the ones that will make the most impact, as well as the ones that need to be replaced first. So we have some options there. Right. So to that end, what, what we're hoping to accomplish tonight is um, I'd like um, the board to authorize Stephanie and I and Bob to go forward with this grant and apply $200,000 of our ESSER funds. Now, that's going to come off the top. Right? So unfortunately, and I shared the memos with you, where there's an appeal out there to change that, but that couldn't count towards our 49%. That, that would have to come off the top and be sort of equally shared between the state and the, and the town. And that, that's disappointing. Hopefully that'll change, and maybe you all get this circular memo tomorrow saying it was, <laughs> right? That's how fast, like Bob said, aggressive timeline is an understatement, almost, they always hear me, obnoxiously aggressive timeline. At least <laughs> give us a couple more weeks, right? I mean, really yeah. abusive um, in terms <laughs> of trying to, to get all this together. And I can't even imagine what towns are doing if they have to take this to bonding measure, measures and can't do this through town meetings and things. Right, or if they didn't oh, have a, they right. didn't they already have, have a study done, done that <laughs> indicating right. what work needed to happen in their or district. they've got yeah. twice as many schools yeah. that they're right. now looking at. Well, right. maybe they won't be able to do it, which will make Arkham That's what what even That's more appealing right. because yeah. we did do the hard work to get it done. And which and is why it's important for us to go after it in this round. Yeah. There may be exactly. future rounds of funding, but it's not a guarantee. No, so we we need to go after this. Yeah. So that's the first ask. Now, we may need another special board meeting because there are a couple of other wheels that are turning here and they're going to have to turn very quickly because we've got to write this grant. Tomorrow night, the Board of Selectmen is meeting. We met with Ryan and Ryan has said the number 120,000 as far as what he is comfortable asking the Board of Selectmen for out of contingency funding that the town has. He's going to ask for that, and that's that would be the 120,000 would be part of Portland's 49%. So let's just split the difference and say 50%. We would then be able to apply for 120,000 out of this grant. Right now, the other piece of this that Ryan talked with us about is he would be comfortable looking at some of the American Rescue Plan funding that the town has available to also apply that to the grant. Stephanie made a call to the state today to see if we can co-mingle ESSER and ARPA funds in that way. And we I haven't heard back yet. <laughs> so I was hoping I would, but I haven't heard back yet. Right. Well, so if they come back and say, yes, you can co-mingle those funds and do this, that again, whether that comes off the top or goes to our 50%, that, that is another consideration. Right. If, it, if we can't use ARPA funds, because you can't co-mingle them, or it all comes off the top and the, the town looks at that and says, yeah, we'd rather use it for other things because we're not putting that money to work for us. I think it may be a valuable conversation for us to have as a board about whether we then consider applying some Fund 11 funds to that 120000 Now, that Fund 11 wouldn't be off the top. That would be part of the town's share, right? Maybe, and, and we talked about this, and, and this is a conversation for a special board meeting after we get the answers to whether ARPA funds can be commingled. But if we said 100, 150,000 of Fund 11 funds, in addition to the town's 120, we'd get that number up to 370, right, or thereabouts. It's important to get that number higher because that's what we'll be matched with. Right. So if we took, if things worked out, 200 S are off the top, 100 from the town fund, 100 and let's just say 100 from fund 11, that would get us to two, 220. We would then be able to ask for 220 and we'd be there, right? So we would have what we need to get these 17 rooftop units done. Right. So I'm, this is all happening in real time and I don't have answers. Right now, my first ask for the board is to, um, and I have to include the motions and the minutes showing that the, the town has authorized me to, and Stephanie to, as part of our grant application, say off the top 200 out of ESSER 
to get us down the path. Yeah. And then, of course, I will be attending tomorrow night's Board of Selectmen meeting, and hopefully we'll be in the process of securing that $120,000 <laughs> commitment. And by that time, hopefully, Stephanie will, will have gotten a phone call back, and we'll know whether it's American Rescue Plan funds on the town or a special meeting likely as early as the end of this week or next week, right, right before Thanksgiving, where we talk about the possibility of using Fund 11 so we can bolster that number, which is our 49% of the project cost. And Ryan did indicate yesterday that he would, that he and Michelle would notice a meeting this morning so that that is already in the works so that this, this will be moving forward and the, all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted so that we can have the public hearing and the town meeting before December 1st. So I think we have a, we have several pathways to to figure out, but this is a really exciting opportunity and, yeah. and a really another very good thing the state has done by recognizing, in addition to mental health, at, at indoor air quality as a priority. We're all just a little frustrated with the timing, like the aggressive nature of the bodies that have to be so quick. Anybody at the state hear me, please? How about just till the end of December, maybe? But the timeline is what it is, and we're going to do it because. We want to get this done because it's a need. It I mean, is. It's Absolutely. it's not a want. It's it's a need. Yeah. Has, has there been any more uh, notice or talk from the professional organizations, CAPS and CAVE, about changing that requirement that you can't, that you know, you the change for the fifty percent. I, I, just that um, every superintendent and town manager and CAVE and CAPS and anybody who as a lobby group or a voice is, is saying, <laughs> come on, people. Like, I mean, yeah. this this is needed and, and help towns out with, with these yeah. things. It's, um, but haven't heard anything yet. But again, this is happening so quickly. Like the, I, said, I don't there may think be anybody's had really had time to go back up. Oh, the legislature's not in session either. So, right, and we just went through know, elections yeah. and, you know, it's yeah. been a very... Yeah, so there hasn't been... Dust settling. Right, yeah, right. So, but we're hope, hopeful of people are listening and we'll say you can use it that way and you can have until the end of December, take your time and a breath and enjoy Thanksgiving and don't spend your whole break writing a grant. Otherwise, we'll do it. And right. Yeah, no, this is too important. But it seems like at a minimum, we'll be asking the state, we'll be, we'll be in a position to ask the state for a, what, 130-ish, whatever their 51% is, Assuming to match the town's 120,000. And, and it sounds like there are pathways to chip away at that even a little bit more to access access some more of these state dollars. Mm -hmm. Correct. Would, would, would we be using all of the Fund 11 money, or would we have any no. there for contingency? So that's definitely a conversation for a special meeting in the future if right. we need to go down that route. Yeah, because you don't want to We wouldn't use it all. It there. would be unwise to use it all. That's our emergency right. fund. Right. Oh, yeah, exactly. Right. That's, yeah. But we so you can supplement, would, but not. We, we could use it. some of it, but it would, would, wouldn't be, be smart to use all of it because yeah. things break. Yeah. yeah. But if these things break, it's going to be more money anyway, and that's where, you know, this, the parts of the school have already experienced broken um, uh, rooftop units where the heat cooks the front office and guidance offices. <laughs> <in summer. laughs> Just none of For that. sure. Is that why Kelly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good, no. I hope not. Well, I'm, I'll be happy to make the recommendation to the board to pursue. I'll read it so that we get it right here. Mm -hmm. To recommend to the Portland Board of Education that the board approve the allocation of $200,000 of remaining ESSER funds to upgrade the HVAC system at the Portland Secondary School as proposed in the superintendent's proposal. Great. Is there a second for that motion? A second, Betty. Thank you, Tim. Is it, can I just question, of question course. The, the $200,000, and I, I'm sure you told this and I have it written down somewhere, mm -hmm. does that wipe out our ESSER funds? No. Or no? So our SR funds are still allocated right now for the mental health worker right. for this year and next year. Right. Uh, well, that's committed, committed though. Committed. I mean, is there yes. any other uncommitted SR funds? <coughs> and, uh, and for a um, summer learning program for right. the summer. Also a summer committed. learning program for <laughs> Right, that's what I mean. I, <laughs> I mean, think he means anything beyond I know beyond we have those, those commitments. Before. And about $65,000. So there is some yes. there that, yeah. Right, so Stephanie and I, Talked about it, and we didn't yeah. want to say all 268. Yeah, that's what we have. 268, right? Remaining. I think so. Yeah, maybe 267.5 or something. We 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 thought 200. It's just nice to have a little there mm -hmm. as we go into. We don't know what heating is going to look like this year. Right. We did right. increase our sub pay, add the English, uh, right. increase the uh, 
teacher of English as a foreign language, add the, the um, uh, kindergarten teacher. Yeah. We've, we've written quite a few checks. It's, it's nice to have that there. Want to have a cushion. <laughs> want to have a cushion. So yeah. we didn't yeah. want to not have a cushion, but, but right. even 200 is a, that was mm -hmm. a nice cushion. I mean, it will, yeah. I'll say for a little oh, yeah. as well, yeah. but yeah. It, it's still, there's still a cushion. Right. And we still have to spend it. We have a deadline to yeah. spend that money. So Correct. if we don't use it yeah. here, we we're going to yeah, we're gonna have to use it. Yeah. 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 Um, that's a good question. Are there any other, any other questions or comments? Any further discussion? Yeah. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Excellent. I don't think Thank I need you. the other motion right now. I don't think so either. I, I think w let's hold on that one. I mean, I'm, I'm taking this as you're authorizing me to go write this grant. Um, yes. I, I, I don't think we're, I hope we're not going to need a special meeting, but I have a feeling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, I think we're going to need one. So you don't think you need a formal? Yeah, you know what? I probably uh, now that I think one? about it, yeah, you yeah. Have it would be nice to have in the minutes that you're saying, Charles, go write this grant. I, I believe yes. we all support yeah. you on this in this, and it's not a bad idea. Yeah. I don't think I, that I, I, I think that even that if we do end up meeting a special meeting. I, I agree. Okay. Yep. Stacy, you think you were ready yes, to read it. So I can make the motion to recommend to the Board of Education that the Board approve the grant application for HVAC system improvements at the Portland Secondary School as proposed by the Superintendent of Schools. I'll second that. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Meg. Any further conversation or discussion around that? No. I'm just trying to wrap my head around the, because we've already voted to use the so we're, we're approving a grant application that's not been written yet. Right. We're, but, we had to approve the money. How do we money. approve a, well, we had I mean, I would say we're approving the writing of the grant, but the, we can't approve the grant application because we don't. I think what, what, what we're trying to signal in this motion, Tim, is that when, when we write the grant, we, we, when we attended the webinar, the grant reviewers are going to want to see the Board of Selectmen and mm -hmm. the Board of Education taking affirmative action Committed to money. saying, right. here's the money, yeah. you just said 200,000, and yeah. we, we need to do this. Right. right. Th that's sort right. of what I, we're getting at there is we're saying to the grant reviewers, this isn't the superintendent alone on, on an island, this is the Board of Education and the Board of Selectmen affirming we need this, we want this, we're putting our money where our mouth is and have done the work. Th that's sort of, it, it, when it was difficult when I was writing that motion, exactly how to say well, it. Well, yeah, like, if written is if the grant's been so right, and already it, written. That's right. And, and it's and not. And it's so not to me, I have a problem with that language. So yeah. just a point of order, could we use the word um, the submission of the grant application? In other words, I, I see I see. We approve the writing. Uh, approve the, the submission to write a grant. The, the writing and yeah, submission. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I would be fine with that because it it's more accurate language. So yeah, so right, so the writing and agree. submission of the grant yeah. application. Yes, and then All I right. think that that will be reflected in the minutes that I share. And again, that's the the board saying to the, the state and the reviewers, we will, we we need this. Yeah. So Stacy, as, as you made the original motion, so, wait, so the do you want to approve the? I will make. Oh, like it's amended. So yes, it's, an, it's an amendment. Do you want me to amend it and then read the whole thing again with yeah. the new? I think that would be helpful. Okay. Um, make a motion to recommend to the Portland Board of Education that the board approve the writing and submission of the grant application for HVAC system improvements at the Portland Secondary Schools as, propo as proposed by the Superintendent of Schools. And I'll second that. Okay. Any further conversation about this new amended motion? No. no. <laughs> but it's Does everyone feel comfortable with that as yeah, written? Point, point well, thank you. Yeah. 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 All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Excellent. I suppose, well, we could leave it at that. I suppose technically we should have had Stacy rescind. Well, no. Oh, I think, fine. I think, wait, no. We amended. No, there's an amendment. It was an amendment. Yeah. Yeah. An amendment. Yeah. We were good. Yeah. Point of we're order. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as long as Trisha got on <laughs> for a while. Yeah. Do you feel We're clear good. on that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, All no. right, I feel clear on it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm comfortable with it. All right, um, thank you all for that. I think you clearly have the board's support to move forward oh, yes. with this and the board's appreciation for all the work mm -hmm. that's going into making yeah, this thank happen. Thank Bobby, he's doing amazing work. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, don't we'll forget to as take well. a break and eat turkey on Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, and hopefully the, the Board of Selectmen will meet tomorrow night and all do you want to win this? The, do you want board members I'm going to be there. I know Bob's going to be there. Um, I will be there as well. You're welcome to join us. Otherwise, yeah. tune in on Zoom. Yep. All right. Um, that concludes our new business, and we do not have any old business on our agenda. So we're going to move to committee reports. Um, up first, we have curriculum, and I will just summarize quickly that we had a good meeting with Eric uh, this past week, mm -hmm. right? And um, uh, Kate came and joined us for the first portion of the of the curriculum meeting. She gave us um, some thoughts that she shared with us some thoughts that she has about how we can um, expand programming at the high school to better meet the needs of all of our high school students, whether they're heading to college or career or both. Um, and she has some really interesting thoughts, and I, I believe she's going to come be back with the curriculum committee at some point in the future and anticipates bringing this to the full board as part of the budget process. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, I will also say that Eric gave us uh, a, a rough draft of his data presentation around, um, around how our students are performing on all the various um, standardized tests in Portland. And um, it's very thorough. We can look forward to that. That will be happening for the full board at our next meeting, December 6th. And so I just kind of wanted to give you all a heads up that the curriculum committee felt it was important that he not just send us the data and answer questions, but that he, you know, be here and walk us all through it because it's it's really important stuff. Um, so please be prepared that that meeting may be a little bit lengthy. He is going to do a pre-read though, so yes. he is going to send something ahead to kind of give some definitions and to give some guidance and how the data is being presented. So that's great. That's right. Um, so we will all look forward to that at our next meeting. Um, did you have anything else that you wanted to add from that nope. meeting? No. Nope. All right. Uh, that's curriculum policy. December 14th is our next meeting. I will be there. <laughs> not other than that. And you all, you saw the policies that we worked on we this, this yep. last time. Yeah. And I think the State Department of Education just put out a statement about uh, restraints and um, seclusion rooms after the hype on the news. And so we can look at our policy just mm -hmm. to make sure we're updated. and. It reflects um, the, the present uh, best practices. All right. Uh, personnel, we had a. Coming up. Sorry. We have one coming up in uh, two weeks. Next week, I think it's the week after after Thanksgiving, yeah. the twenty eighth, perhaps. Um, but we did have a meeting. Twenty eighth. We had a meeting two weeks ago. Is that right, Tim? Um, and yes. talked about quite a few things. Yeah. Charles. Charles. And Stephanie are working on an RFP for around our substitutes. As you all know, our ESS contract is up this year, um, so they're hard at work on figuring out kind of what our what our best path forward will be with substitutes. And budget season's here, so we have some ideas to share with the personnel committee around positions. That's exciting. Um, yep. Yeah, so we had a very productive meeting, and anticipate another one in the next next week or so. Do you want to add anything? No, I didn't bring those notes with me. But yeah, okay. we've had some good. I will say we've had some. Really good discussions. I think we're grappling with some great issues that we yeah. be able to come to the whole board with. Yeah. Um, buildings and grounds. I believe Nothing. you all had a meeting, didn't we, you? We did. Um, did we report on it? We no. did. No, we didn't. No. Well, basically, we, we met with Bob and we talked about the HVAC. We um, looked at a lot of alternatives. Dave had some really good questions um, in the same vein as Tim about whether or not we had to do all 17 uh, rooftop units. Could there be less? Um, but we're going to do for the whole thing and see what we get out of it and um, we'll look forward to uh, getting that letter in the mail that says we have that grant and we'll <laughs> have probably have another <laughs> meeting so but building the grounds everything is good right now we're holding good. our own yep no, no crises is a good, no, <laughs> a good no, thing <laughs> no it is, no it's it's good okay. it's all good all right um uh, meg crick is tomorrow um <laughs> 11 o'clock and I, I will stay for the policy meeting uh following the regular meeting and, right. it. Um, and Dave is not here to give us a, an update on the selectmen. So we'll move on. Committee on Solidarity. Tim? Um, uh, they, I, I don't know if they met on Election Day or not. I think they, they canceled their meeting. I think they did. They did? I believe yeah. they did. Okay, yeah, I wasn't available, so I wasn't able to go to that. But um. <clears throat> They might have had it the following week, but I'm not, 
I'm not sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I know, okay. I, I read, I think that the Committee on Solidarity and the uh, Social Justice Coalition have kind of combined. And they're, they're working together now, I believe. Mm. All right. Um, Equity and Inclusion Coalition, do you have a meeting this month? There, yeah, there's a meeting uh, Thursday, this set Thursday the 17th, so the follow-up. Um, All right. Uh, School Facility Study Committee. We are meeting on December the 6th. Um, we were waiting for some information from the town financial planner, and hopefully we will have that, and uh, we will continue our exploration of facilities. December 6th. Is that after? I think it's Monday that, the 5th. I was going to say, December 6th yeah. is our next board meeting. Monday the oh, 5th. Oh, it's the 5th. Yeah. I think there's okay. a mistake then. If I copied it incorrectly, I just looked. Okay. So uh, you all are meeting the 5th, which so means it's the we fifth. should be hearing something I, on the 6th, yeah, perhaps? Yeah, I think yeah. we better look. Okay. Well, I you better look at the like we <laughs> something uh, good. Uh, uh, we'll see what yeah. the financial planner has to say. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I think <laughs> um, I'll, I'll recheck that, too, because Lou Pear might have said out the wrong date. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll confirm that. <laughs> um, and we don't currently have a Youth Services Advisory Board liaison, right. um, so we'll just skip along there. Uh, audience of citizens, do we have anybody online who wishes to address the board? Okay. Um, board of Education member comments. Um, I'll, I guess I'm going to start really quickly and just share. I know you, some of you, hopefully everybody saw their email today. Um, but just in case you didn't have a chance to, Lauren Christensen sent the board her letter of resignation effective immediately. Um, she's just, I think, <laughs> overrun with law school and um, unable to continue with her board of ed commitment. And I'm sure you'll all join me in wishing her Absolutely. the very best of luck with law school and thanking her for her service to the board. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so this is this is just the official official. <coughs> whatever the word that, that Lauren has resigned. Yeah. She's <laughs> probably home reading right now. Maybe so. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or hopefully sleeping. Or sleeping. Sleep. Yeah. Um, anyhow, let's zip down the line. Did you have anything, Stacy? No, just really appreciated the school spotlight and the library ambassadors. Yeah. I thought that's a great program. Yeah. Isn't so. that great? Mm -hmm. It's really, I think it's really pretty special. Yep, I agree. It is. It is. Uh, Tim. No, 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 thanks. Kim? Yeah, a couple of things. Mm -hmm. um, Meg, Tim, and I attended the Veterans Day mm -hmm. event, and um, I one. thought it was really impactful and um, well thought out, well planned. Um, the format was great because it was so intimate. They were right there. The panelists had um, good answers to questions, so I think it was a great event. Um, the other one quick <coughs> item, and I did um, email Charles ahead of time, mm -hmm. is just about last week's um, middle school, high school, early release that happened unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. um, I ha did get feedback from a couple of families in town, um, and I'm one of those. Four o'clock, I looked at my phone and read my email and said, oh, I guess my kids went home early today. Mm -hmm. And I have the luxury that they're old enough that yeah. they were taken care of, but I did hear from families that said, oh, I wish I had gotten a text or a phone call about that just have a heads up so um, mm -hmm. just in the future if we could do that versus email which is I think less ex accessible to people during their work day so that's all yeah mm -hmm. we'll do that for sure well um, a couple of things um, Karen I did the library thing tonight and um, the CABE conference CABE um, CAPS conference is going on this weekend starting on Thursday with a resolution um, meeting. Uh, we're developing the legislative actions for 2023. Um, Karen is going to be presenting at a workshop with um, the SICA and CASEL um, officers, which are um, CASEL is the School Librarian Association, SICA is the um, Educators, Computer Educators Association, and they're going to be talking about libraries, how important they are. Um, they're going to be speaking to board members and superintendents and principals uh, about not cutting budgets to libraries because they do um, provide for um, a high student achievement. Um, we also have plenty of issues with parents coming to boards uh, wanting to remove materials and librarians are on the front line of uh, the First Amendment uh, right to read and free speech um, when you limit um, library materials. 
you limit the um, ability for democracy to function properly. So I'm really excited to be able to take that conversation to board members and to um, superintendents. Um, we preach to the choir all the time. I'm a former school librarian um, at Valley View for 28 years and um, Karen and I have been colleagues and um, her passion and my passion is to make sure that libraries are um, recognized for what they do. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm going to be going to the resolution. I, and are you going to the resolution? I won't be there you Thursday, won't? but I'll be so, there Friday. And so Saturday. I'll be a, I'll be the uh, kind of the delegate, but I'm also the second vice president of government relations. So um, this is important to me because this is the work that I will do in the spring um, for Cape. So um, it's it's a very exciting time. And the other thing is, I attended a redesigning educational conference, which was teachers talking about what they want to see or how they want to see education redefined in the future. And um, assessment was a big part of the topic. I participated in two programs. One was about schools within schools um, doing things more like project-based learning and mastery learning. Um, the keynote speaker talked about assessment and how we may be over-assessing our kids um, and gave a lot of reasons, you know, uh, uh, for the negative as well as the positive uh, reasons for assessments. We're gonna be talking about our assessments here in Portland, mm -hmm. which is, is one way to, to re register whether or not our kids are doing well. Um, but it could be done, we could be doing it in different ways. And um, I also went to a diversity and equity um, workshop. Um, very, very interesting um, information out of Bridgeport, the people, um, principal of an elementary school. Um, I'm happy to share any information with, uh, with anybody that is interested, but um, it was interesting to hear teachers' voices because they feel, um, and, and I guess I think the same thing sometimes, when you're in the classroom, the last people that get asked whether or not it's a good idea or not are the teachers. Mm -hmm. And then they say, oh, when did that happen? Or how did that get passed? Um, we need to hear more, um, more of teachers' voices. So these were all leaders within their districts and there were um, a pretty well attended Patrice McCarthy from CABE uh, was there and she um, was on one of the panels. So it was good, it was very, very enlightening. That was on voting day, uh, election day. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. If you have materials, Nothing. I will, and I've got that yep, you want to share with us. Yep, I would, I would yeah, board. I will, absolutely. All right. And that's it. Okay, well thank you. Um, is anybody else able to attend any part of the CABE um, convention this this weekend? No. no. Are okay. you going to be able to attend any part of it? I am not. No. Okay. Point, that's all right. That's okay. I hear you. You got your hands. Yeah. yeah. No. It's uh, all right. Well, I also am very excited about this yeah. presentation that Karen's going to yeah. be part of, and yeah. I'm excited to be there to support. Yeah. It's support her and have Portland visits. schools represented. It's kind of cool. Absolutely. And she did an amazing job. She really <laughs> ran with this. Got these people, the officers from the state organizations, to also come because it is important, yeah. it is. Libraries yeah. are important. Mm -hmm. All right, I do not believe we have any reason to go into executive session this evening, so that said, is there a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Tim, Meg. Meg eight seconds, it's 8.58, eight 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 we're gonna eight adjourn. Eight. We're gonna go see the snow. Oh, uh, all in favor. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go see the snowflakes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I hope we can drive safely. Yeah. yeah. I stopped and tasted it.